Hello, everyone, and welcome to Teaching in Room 9. The reason shapes are everywhere we look. But we have a job. Now, go ahead and touch your throat right here and see how they feel. And say to ourselves, to be positive. Lemurs are found on the island of Madagascar. For one, and the numbers get bigger as we go across to the right. Reset. That means taking a deep breath. It may mean counting to 10. Today, we're going to start with a freestyle throat. So I'm going to put my arm up. All righty, are you ready to learn? Let's go! Welcome to Teaching in Room 9, the region's largest classroom. I am Dr. Sanders, and in our new classroom, we can go anywhere and be anything while we are learning all about our community. But remember what I always say, it doesn't matter if you're two or 102, you will have some fun, F-U-N fun. You will have some fun while learning. I work at Adams Elementary in the St. Louis Public Schools and let's get our day started. Shout out some of my friends who are watching. My first name is Mira. Hi Mira. How are you doing today? Excellent. Let's spell Mira. Capital M-I-R-A. M-I-R-A. My next name is Nakia. Hi, Nakia. Is your day going well? Great, great. Let's spell Nakia. Capital N-A-K-I-A. N-A-K-I-A. My next name is Alex. Hey, Alex. Let's spell Alex. Capital A-L-E-X. A-L-E-X. And my last name today is Keenan. Hey, Keenan. Yeah, are you paying attention? Great, great. Let's spell Keenan. Capital K-E-E-N-A-N. K-E-E-N-A-N. -E -E -N. My names are done. So what is it time for? Our new adventure. Let's get this party started. Just like at home, there will be times that you want to share your ideas and ask questions. But remember, yelling and waving won't do the trick with your teacher. Instead, raise your hand and sit quietly. That's the best way to get your teacher to call on you, polite and patient. Let's review today's lesson. Remember, when you have an idea or a question, raise your hand and sit quietly. Being polite gets you noticed in your class. So let's learn together and have fun while being respectful in our classroom. Hi everyone, welcome to Teaching in Room 9. I'm Miss Williams, I teach second grade at Confluence Academy All North, and I'm here today to teach you guys all about estimation. That's a hard word, but I think I can help you figure out what it means. Estimation means you don't just count something yet, you make a very, very good guess. Now it's not just any old guess, not a wild guess, this has to be a very good guess. So let's see. Pretend like you're in class and you're going along and you're like, oh, today is my birthday. Oh, happy birthday to you. But I forgot to bring stuff for my class. I wanted to bring popsicle sticks, but I have no idea how many people are in my class. Let me think. I can make an estimation about how many students I can bring for popsicle sticks, popsicles for. Let's think. I know there's more than one because I'm one. It has to be more than two. A good guess or an estimate might be 19 people in my classroom to bring popsicles for. 
That's a good guess, a good estimate. And then you can finally count to see how many you have. You want to go a little bit higher than lower just in case you're off by this much. Let's also get a little bigger in that estimation. What if Miss Williams wants to take all of the pre-K classes in your school to the zoo? Hmm, well, if I have 19 people in your class, maybe there's the same amount of people in the other classrooms. Let's take, make an estimate. If there's 19 in one class and there are three classes, what would be a good guess or an estimate for how many kids Miss Williams can take to the zoo? What do you guys think? Three classes, what's a good guess or an estimate? How many students would I need to bring to the zoo? Hmm. I hope you got those guesses in. I would estimate it's about 36 students to take to the zoo. That's a good guess. Would a good guess be 100 students to take to the zoo? No, I think that's too many, way too many. If one class only has 19, three classes probably wouldn't have 100 kids. Would a thousand students be a good guess? Would that be a good estimate? No, that's way too many students. A good, an estimate has to be a good guess. That means it's close enough, even though you don't know how many there are all together. Now it's your turn. Can we make some estimates together? I want to take these snap cubes and I want you to take a guess, an estimate about how many snap cubes you see here. Don't count them. We want to take an estimate first, a good guess of how many snap cubes. Can you take an estimate? Okay, let's see if those estimates were right. We're going to count them to find out. One, two, three, four snap cubes. Did your estimate match the actual counting? It did. Good job. How about something a little bit bigger? How about these snap cubes? Ooh, that's a lot more. Remember, we're gonna make an estimate, and it's gotta be a good guess. This is a lot bigger than this one, and we know this one was four snap cubes. So what's your estimate for these snap cubes before we count them? Hmm. I think a good estimate might be 15 snap cubes. Let's find out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. My estimate was really close. It was just a little bit over, but very close. Was your estimate as close to the 10 as mine was? If it was, good job. Well, what if those objects weren't lined up perfectly? What if we were to estimate something that's in a bundle, a group like this? Oof, that's a lot harder. Hmm, I can take a look at it. These are popsicle sticks, I know that. And I know what one popsicle stick looks like. I can look all around it. Hmm, what do you guys think? What's a good estimate for these popsicle sticks? Okay, let's count to find out. I'm gonna take this off and we're gonna count these popsicle sticks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 popsicle sticks. Did you have 10 popsicle sticks in this bundle over your estimate? If so, good job. And it's okay to be a little bit over or a little bit under. So if you guess 12 or if you guess seven, that's still good. That's a good estimate. You knew not to guess 100 popsicle sticks. How about something just a little bit harder? What about this? Ooh, I know you know what these are. These are marbles. That's a lot of marbles though. I can already tell just by looking that's more than 10. What do you guys think? What's a good estimate for these marbles? Hmm, wow, so many. Duh. This is a hard one, guys. Remember, make it a good guess, not wild. Hmm, and this is a pretty big cup, so let's get those estimates in and then we'll find out. Are you guys ready to find out? Okay, I can tell you now how many marbles are in this jar. Are you ready? There are 70 marbles in the jar. Oh my goodness. I didn't think we could fit 70 in this jar. Was your estimate close to 70? Did you count all the way up to 70? That's a big number. If you did, good job. 70 is a lot. But now we get to play with all 70 of them. So 
Remember, every time that you're making an estimate, you're trying to make a good guess, not a wild guess, something very, very close, not too far off, not too big, not too small, just about right. And if our estimate's wrong, that's okay, as long as we made a good guess. I'll see you guys next time, bye. Have you ever been to the St. Louis Science Center before? Let's visit together. What will you see? Hey, how's it going? Come on over. So my name is John and today we're going to be talking about some fossils. This is our fossil dig site. Uh, it's a representation of what actually happens in the field whenever we have paleontologists that go out and dig for dinosaur bones in Montana. So let's go take a look and uh, see if we can find some fossils. So we find all sorts of fossils out in the field. Uh, we find things like Triceratops brow horns, T-Rex femurs, uh, even T-Rex teeth sometime whenever we're lucky. Uh, but you can see here, this is actually kind of what it looks like in the field. We've got these fossils that are sticking out of the ground and then we have to put a little bit of work into uncovering them. So this maybe looks like a Triceratops horn. And we generally can tell that because of the shape and the size. And much like the mulch compared to the cast right here, we see really different looking materials whenever we're comparing the rock and the fossils when we're in the field too. So yeah, let's, why don't we go look at some finished samples uh, over at another exhibit. So to give us a closer look about what these fossils actually look like in the field, we can take a quick peek right here. They're generally the fossils kind of sticking out of the ground like we saw on the dig site over there and we have to dig it out a little bit. Now once we're done with that, we move over to the prep lab uh, where we have some volunteers that actually put those fossils back together because they usually end up in a whole bunch of little pieces. So if you want to, you can step up right there and get a closer look at it if you'd like to. Yeah. So you can see all these little cracks right here um, and those have to be all cleaned out and then glued together. And then whenever they're finished, they look like this, which is a little bit further down. I'll show you some cool stuff here too. So we've got a bunch of hadrosaur fossils here. This is a big leg bone, there's a vertebra. But as you can see, they kind of look really nice once they're all put together. Um, and if we move down even further, then we've got some Triceratops fossils here. Now, like I said, we find all of these in Montana. Um, and that's because the rock that's there was actually formed during the Cretaceous area, about 66 million years ago when dinosaurs were alive. So that's why we get those fossils in that area. So let's keep going. I'll show you a little bit more uh, about why we find fossils and where we find them. So as you can see, this is a big map of North America and it's super colorful and awesome looking. And what we're actually looking at is that these different colors represent the age of different rocks. So what this is telling us is essentially that we can find fossils anywhere. Uh, those fossils are just gonna be different types, right? So like I said, in Montana, uh, where we have kind of some of this green stuff, we find those dinosaur fossils. But if you look closer at a place like Missouri, which is right around here, we find fossils that are even older. So you can actually go out in your backyard and find all sorts of cool ancient marine life. I guarantee you, if you just pick through a couple rocks, you'll see some uh, fossils in them, which is kind of neat. So let's go a little bit further and look at some of what uh, those fossils look like. Let's check out the specimens. So here are some good examples of some specimens of things that we find in Missouri. You can see these things are like little old squids. These are called crinoids, which this is actually Missouri's state fossil, which is kind of cool. We find these everywhere. And generally, uh, they look like teeny little screws when we find them in the ground. We've got some ferns, and then we have some more shells. And then this over here is actually a really recent fossil, probably from the last 60,000 years or so, which I know sounds like a long time, but in fossil terms, that was like yesterday. This is a mastodon, which is the North American version of a woolly mammoth, which is kind of cool to see. Yeah. 
here we've got some dinosaur fossils. These are both 66 million years old. So these dinosaurs would have been walking around during the Cretaceous period, like right before the asteroid fell, which is okay. crazy. So you guys are welcome to touch both of these. That is a Triceratops browhorn. So it would have come from like right, right. here on a Triceratops. Like, right here at the end. Like more towards the middle. So this is kind of our middle chunk. Um, and this is a hadrosaur vertebrae. So it would have come from the hadrosaur's back, likely from its tail. And we can tell that because this little process like sticks off the front right here. Yeah. yeah. So what we've got here is a Triceratops rib. Now this is one of my favorite fossils that we've got because I think it really gives you a sense of scale about just how big these animals were. So this is just one rib, right? This is where it would have attached to its spine. And if I put it up to compare to myself, it would have looked something like this, right? So these animals were absolutely massive. visiting the St. Louis Science Center with us. What did you notice on our visit? You know what time it is? It is movement time. So everybody, please stand up. Today, we're gonna do a little different movement. We're gonna play hopscotch. I'm going to show you how to play hopscotch, and then I'm going to show you how to uh, go up and down the board. You think I can do that? Probably not. What? All right. Only thing you have to do is you can draw a hopscotch board anywhere with some chalk or with tape inside the house, and make sure you count to 10. Let's count to 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten! Ten! All right, now, once you have your squares, what you're going to do is get you an object and toss it into one of the numbers. What number is that? Five. That is right, that is five. And then you got to hop. Remember to hop open, hop open. You're going to hop and make sure you don't touch that number. You want to see me try? And as I'm doing it, you do it as well. All right? Do you think I can do it? Here we go. One, one, because I can't do two in that box. One, two, one, and then I hop out. And then I, on the way back, I throw it again. What number did it land on? Seven. Y'all ready to help me? Here we go. One, two. Oh, I'm going to pick up the number seven, and I'm going to skip two, one, one. Woo, we made it back. Did Dr. Sanders do a great job? All right, did you do a good job? Don't forget to practice your hopscotching. It's time to sit down, are you ready? Let's sit down on three. One, two, three. Up, down, up, down. Sit right down on the ground, or the floor, or the chair, or the seat. But don't sit on the table. All righty, I'll see you in a bit. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Hi, learners. Welcome back to Teaching in Room 9, our region's largest classroom. My name is Julia. I'm a first grade teacher at the Soulard School. And here for Teaching in Room 9, this is our song time. Songs are a great and fun way for us to connect letters and sounds. Today, our song is going to focus on onset rhyme, so the beginning sounds of words and the rhyme, the end of the word that sounds the same. Onset rhyme are the parts found in a word. Blend the first sound with the rhyme and tell me what you heard. <sighs> At hat. Onset rhyme are the parts found in a word. Blend the first sound with the rhyme and tell me what you heard. W At wet. Onset rhyme are the parts found in a word. Blend the first sound with the rhyme and tell me what you heard. B. It. Bit. Great job, friends. Being able to chunk our words into the beginning sounds and the rhyme helps us when we're reading and writing new words. I'm so proud of you. Kiss your brains. I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.
Welcome back to our favorite classroom. It looks so amazing. Now it's time for our favorite wildlife expert. Yes, that's right. Mr. Bear Hands Moran. Hey, 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 Dr. Sanders. How are you doing Man, today? I am doing great. I am doing great. And oh. today we have Elijah, a ringtail lemur. Oh, I like Elijah looks hungry. Is Elijah Eli hungry? Elijah always wants a few snacks. Always like wants a few. Uh -huh. he, he's never lacking in the snack department. But, you know, ringtail lemurs are found on the island of Madagascar. Ooh, where, where is Madagascar? It is way off on the other side of the Africa continent. Oh, okay. One of the seven continents. So this, this is a red tail lemur. Um, ring tail. Ring not ring red tail, tail. it's ringtail. Why right. is it why is it called a ringtail lemur? Well, because he has 13 of these wonderfully black ringtails. It looks more like a zebra tail to me. Oh no, don't tell him that. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sorry. Ze ze zebras are on the main continent. Oh, okay. Okay, he's on the island. He's okay. on the island. Okay. Yeah. So, um they are a primate. Ringtail lemurs are a primate, so he's closely related to all monkeys. They do have opposable thumbs both on their hands and on their feet. That's like us, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody do this. Yep. <laughs> Excellent climbers. However, the ringtail lemur is very terrestrial. Like they like to run around on the ground. Oh, so they don't, so all the monkeys or lemurs, primates don't climb in trees? Not all of them. Okay. You know, uh, Madagascar being separated from the main continent so many eons ago, everything developed a little bit differently on the continent. The ringtail lemurs are one species of lemur. There's over 47 species, and they fill every ecological niche on the island. There's a mouse lemur all the way up to a cat lemur. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Okay. He's so cute. Mm. He's so cute. You know, and can I pet him? Yeah, you can pet him right here on the back like okay. that. Okay. But my question is. Can we have these as pets? You asked me, can we have these as pets? So the answer is yes. Should we have these as pets? The answer is no. Okay, why not? Well, even though he seems really cute and he's pretty soft and he's a beautiful animal, they require a lot of husbandry. And we humans have busy lives and we just can't give them the emotional and psychological support that they need to be healthy. Okay, you said husbandry. Is that like wifeidry? Not exactly, so but it's just the care of, you know, taking care of an animal. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, they require a lot of physical touch and they require a lot of presence. In other words, they want you to be home all the time. They need you to be in their life constantly. Okay, okay. That's like uh, my kids at school. You know, sometimes they just want you to be there all the time, but you have other students to take care of. Yeah, yeah. He, he looks like he's just eating, eating away. He's oh. having a great old, grand old time. Hey, and what's what. it? What is he eating right now? So he's eating mostly raisins out of there, but you see, there's a little M and M there now and then. Mm -hmm. So he likes that sweet. Ooh. Yeah. Me and him can be buddies. Mm -hmm. In the wild, though, they eat a lot of sticks and leaves and things that fall off trees. What do they get from sticks? Uh, it's the fiber content, but you know, on Madagascar and some of the areas that the ringtail lemur inhabits, it becomes very arid in the summertime, and there's just not a lot of nutrition around. They will literally eat anything. Now, if they catch a small lizard or a bug, they'll eat that too. Oh, okay. So they're omnivores. 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 Yeah. What omnivores? Yes, that means eat they eat everything. everything. They okay. Ooh, I learned that yeah. from you. They're, they're, they're not specialists when it comes to their diet. They'll eat just about anything they, they can find. Okay, what do they get? Do they, what about water in their diet? So ringtail lemurs do drink what we consider standing water or free water, but they also get a lot of the water from the foods that they eat. Okay. So they, if they come across a stream, they will drink from it, but they can go days without drinking. Not like us. We need some water all the at, time. At, at least every three days. Is it possible that I can hold Mr. You know, um, he is a little temperamental, and he has a mouthful of very sharp teeth like a possum. Yes. And so I would prefer just petting him. That, and I can, mm -hmm. you, you think can he'll share him. some M&Ms with me? No, he would definitely bite you. You try to get his food. <laughs> All right, I won't do that. 
Well, everybody say, hi, bye, Mr. Lemur. Bye-bye. All right. Wave and, bye, Elijah. And as we had another amazing animal on our, in our classroom, and I'll see you in a bit. Great day. This is Candace with Chaos, and I want to introduce you to my friend, Kyra. Here's Kyra right here. Kyra is so cool. So Kyra is a person that loves to dance, and she loves to sing, and she kind of likes to make up choreography. Do you like to make up dances to songs that you like? I know that I do. And so Kyra also is a person that talks a lot. Kyra's a lot like I am. And so sometimes Kyra talks in class when Kyra's not supposed to. And sometimes Kyra talks over people when they're talking to her, and that sometimes makes people frustrated with her. And so she gets corrected a lot especially in classrooms and different places in the community. And so Kyra wants people to be patient with her. Can you say patient? Patient stands for pause and think. Inhale, exhale, now talk or now tap out. And so when Kyra's having a hard time, Kyra has to think, is now a time for me to talk or do I need to tap out? And so we always tap out when we feel that we're going to say something that could be rude or mean to somebody or hurt somebody's feelings. So if we feel that that's going to happen when we speak, we always tap out and we come back at a different time. And when we tap out, you can be like Kyra and you can sing a song or you can make up some dance moves and then you can come back and deal with it a little bit later because it's absolutely okay for us to feel our feelings. Just sometimes we have to feel our feelings and come back and talk about them later. So I want you to try out the patient skill, let an adult know how it works out, and then we can come back and talk about it. Have a great day. Air hugs and Cyril kisses. Welcome back, everybody, to this classroom. Do you think you can beat me in a hopscotch? Ooh, okay, we'll see. How was your adventures today? All right, but you know what time it is? It is time for us to get out of room nine. But before we get out, let's spell our special word, our favorite special word. What is, it's nine. Let's spell nine. N-I-N-E. Nine. Thank you for being in room nine. Bye-bye. Teaching in Room 9 is supported in part by Know who to reach out to when you need help. There is hope. Call or text 988.